Good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us for What Universities Owe Democracy, a conversation about expertise, opportunity, and bridging divides. I'm Stephen Ruckman, Deputy Director of the SNF Agora Institute, an academic center and public forum at Johns Hopkins University that is dedicated to improving and expanding civic engagement and informed inclusive dialogue as the cornerstone of global democracy. I am so delighted to be joined this evening by Johns Hopkins University President Ron Daniels and SNF Agora Associate Research Professor Liliana Mason, who will be discussing President Daniels' new book, What Universities Owe Democracy. Ron Daniels has served as the 14th president of Johns Hopkins University since 2009. Under his leadership, Johns Hopkins has firmly cemented its preeminence in education, patient care, and innovative discovery, and has furthered its long tradition of research excellence. He has also deepened the university's commitment to the city of Baltimore and enhanced student access through historic investments in financial aid. Liliana Mason, Associate Research Professor at SNF Agora and the Department of Political Science, is author of Uncivil Agreement, How Politics Became Our Identity. Her research on partisan identity, partisan bias, social sorting, and American social polarization has been published in journals such as the American Political Science Review, American Journal of Political Science, Public Opinion Quarterly, and Political Behavior, and has been featured in media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and National Public Radio. Welcome to you both, and thank you for being here. Published by JHU Press in October, What Universities Owe Democracy examines the role higher education can play in helping to restore American democracy in this moment of deep peril. Drawing upon a variety of academic fields, including political science, economics, history, and sociology, President Daniels identifies in his book four distinct functions of American higher education that are key to liberal democracy. Social mobility, citizenship education, the stewardship of facts, and the cultivation of pluralistic, diverse communities. During tonight's discussion, President Daniels and Dr. Mason will be discussing how universities have fostered these functions, where they have sometimes faltered, and what they can do going forward. Conversation will last for about 40 minutes, and then we will take questions from the audience. Some of those questions were submitted ahead of tonight's event, but you can still ask your questions at any time during the program using the Q&A function, which is located on the live stream page, either to the right or below your video player, depending on your device. Dr. Mason, I'll turn the conversation over to you now. Thank you, Stephen, uh, for that introduction. And thanks to everyone who is uh, watching us tonight. And I want to thank President Daniels for allowing us to have this conversation together about this extremely timely book. Um, I want to start by saying that this book is coming really at a critical time for American democracy. And um, you know, we've seen democratic norms and institutions uh, undermined and uh, see them falter. We see an American electorate that's so divided that our legislators are almost prohibited from governing. And so because of that, I think it's so important to find a way to address uh, ways to, to heal democracy that are not just legislative, right? Other, other parts of society that can help support democracy. Uh, and you know, as, as my own, from my own perspective as a political scientist and a scholar of American politics, this really is an all hands on deck moment for, for American democracy. So, so thank you so much for uh, for writing this book. I think it's really contributed a lot to my understanding of the possibilities for supporting democracy. Um, and so with that said, I think, uh, why don't we just begin with you saying a few words about the book and what inspired you to write it? So uh, first, Lily, thank you so much uh, for taking on this task. I fear it's a bit of a hazing ritual where uh, new faculty members get uh, plucked to have to interview the president in their first couple of months at the university. So in that spirit, I really do appreciate uh, you taking this on and, and delighted that you've joined Agora and Johns Hopkins and quite excited to have this conversation with you. Um, you know, I think in some sense, you set up the frame for this really perfectly as to why I felt it was important Important, along with my co-authors, Grant Treve and Phil Spector, uh, to tackle this subject. And I think it first and foremost reflects the sense of moment that we're in in America right now in terms of all the things that you know and we um, all lament so well. 
levels of high levels of polarization, of distrust, of distrust in our institutions, of distrust in each other, and the kind of gridlock and gridlock and acrimony that results from that, and the sense that um, as stable, as secure as we thought our democracy was, it seems less so, and particularly in light of uh, January 6. Um, and, and so at one level, um, of course, the last several years and just the intense polarization uh, in this country uh, was it an important catalyst for the book. Um, and to be fair, also was an appreciation of the extent to which outside of our country that we have um, from the certainty and confidence of 1989 and the end of history, we're now seeing that so many countries that we had uh, felt were certain to become stable democracies now seem fragile or in fact have slipped back to authoritarianism. So the, the conditions for democracy seem challenging both here and abroad and, and that of course was an important frame for the book. But in another dimension, and again, it picks up on something you said a moment ago, um, is a strong sense that um, there are a number of bulwark institutions of democracy that I think are implicated in strengthening, preserving uh, our, 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 our enterprise of, uh, of, uh, of a flourishing uh, democracy. And um, as I thought about uh, the core institutions uh, that we traditionally associate with democracy. We typically, I, as a law professor, think of courts, of elected legislatures. Um, you um, may think of uh, the media and independent media and the role that it plays. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized we'll actually inhabit an institution that I think is a critical institution. Indeed, as I argue in the book, an indispensable institution for democracy. And so it's from that perspective that I started to think through um, what are the ways in which we contribute to democracy's flourishing. It's well understood that universities require strong democracy for universities to be strong, but I thought it was important to ask the question in the other way. That is, how do universities contribute to the strength of democracy, and as good as we think we are, is there more that we can do uh, to strengthen democracy in this moment? So the the way that uh, that you start the book is actually the way that I want I'd like to kind of get going in this conversation uh, because we are so polarized at this point that even the terms liberal and democracy are embattled terms, and you have a very specific way of defining both of those terms, and they have very specific meanings in this book. So can you just define what those two terms mean precisely for you in this and purposes of the book? Sure, and um, I do this with some trepidation in a way that I'm speaking to a political uh, science professor. Um, but for me, um, and I think again, this is a you know, common understanding, when we talk about liberal democracy, and that is the particular focus of this book is on liberal democracy, we're thinking about two different ideas. One is the idea of popular sovereignty, and that's typically associated with the idea that we have majoritarian will and that we have elected legislatures that are ultimately accountable to the people at large. And that's an important, uh, an important idea that is traditionally associated with uh, democracy. But the liberal component of this, and it's not liberal in the sense that, uh, that people think about it in contemporary discourse, uh, about being associated with progressive uh, outlook on society, but rather for me, and in the, I think in the widely understood political science sense, uh, liberalism speaks of personal freedom in the sense that there are limits on what the state um, uh, can do, even if it is supported through majoritarian will on the um, interests and rights of individual citizens. So there's clear restrictions on majoritarian will. And so for me, particularly as a law professor, you think of the role that um, constitutions play and the Bill of Rights in limiting the power of the state even where it's supported by majoritarian will, where it seems to be on the surface democratic to be able to trench on certain rights, particularly of minorities. And so it is this, the fusion of these two ideas of 
of uh, majoritarian will, but also of individual rights and, um, and of uh, the need to preserve uh, the individual rights, interests, dignity of the citizens of a state that when we put these two things together, we get liberal democracy. And as you well know, at times, these ideas are in perfect alignment. And there are times that there is grind um, in the state in terms of how you reconcile those ideas. But fundamentally, we do know that as difficult as this enterprise of building and sustaining a liberal democracy is, we do know that it is associated with remarkable uh, achievements. Uh, liberal democracies have significant uh, capacity to advance social mobility, economic growth. Um, they're typically more uh, pacific societies. Um, at, you know, on a number of different dimensions, these are structures of government that do great things for citizenry. And that's why I felt uh, so passionately about the challenges that liberal democracies are facing. And again, going back to how uh, the university can contribute more effectively to its strengthening. Yes. Yeah, so speaking of social mobility um, and these sort of tensions, um, one of the things that were you know that you that you talk about in the book as um, as one of the four pillars of you know, what universities can do to support democracy um, is to increase social mobility. So to help people who are tend to be marginalized in in American society sort of move up um, and 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 kind of increase their uh, their social capital and their and their status in society. Um, but that sort of one of my questions here is that you know. One of the things we're seeing as a driver of polarization is that um, the relative status of different groups of Americans is one of the, the kind of most inflammatory parts of American democracy, where uh, you know sort of t traditionally high status groups who see their not their absolute status but their relative status, where other groups are getting closer to them in terms of status, that is a threat that they feel um, and they respond to with you know, often anti-democratic um, uh, reactions. So how do we mix together this idea of fostering social mobility via the university and also keeping, you know, these status-based conflicts somewhat under, under control and not, and not ex at least not exacerbating these status-based conflicts that we're seeing today? Right. So I, you know, uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, and we know, you know, in terms of just the level of rancor um, and the intensity of debate that we've seen, for instance, around understandings of affirmative action and so forth, we know uh, how inflammatory, how incendiary these ideas are in that enterprise. Um, and so, um, for, you know, it seems to me, first and foremost, you know, when students increasingly drawn from very diverse backgrounds come to the university, you recognize that there's gonna be a lot of priors that people bring as to how people got to this place and their sense of entitlement to be there. And that's where I think first and foremost, the university has to make it clear that um, everyone who has been admitted into uh, the institution, who has membership in it, uh, there's a student, uh, faculty member, staff member, they have an entitlement to be there. They have, they, they, they have a fundamental right to be part of this conversation. And then I think the effort is really to try and find ways in which you can build bridges across those various groups. So that's, you know, that's at one level. At another level, you know, when we think about the issue of access to higher education and the groups that seem to be ascendant and the groups that seem to be threatened by, uh, by the ascent of other groups, I think it's important to start off and just remind ourselves that when it comes to universities, particularly elite higher education, but indeed, you know, the truth is, is for universities, whether public or private, whether in the United States or Europe or Canada, my home country, the fact is that the, um, that the university is traditionally a home of, uh, of students who come from uh, families of extreme privilege. You know, in this country, there are um, about uh, 40 of the top institutions in the country where you have more students 
from the top 1% of the socioeconomic um, distribution than from the bottom 60%. You know, that's a really arresting figure, and it's, it says something important in terms of when we talk about um, who really is at threat from opening up universities. You know, it, it, is a, it is a very elite segment of the population. And that's important because to the extent that there's um, concerns about the new claimants that, you know, who are now coming into our institutions, we often think about this about being about diversity in the sense of race and culture, um, but the, uh, ethnicity. But the fact is, you know, as we work on, for instance, and we become much more conscious of this, bringing more students from Pell eligible families, that is to say families who come from household incomes of $60,000 or less, you know, we're starting to see um, a lot of white um, families that uh, are being represented who were not coming to universities previously. So it's an interesting phenomenon where it, as we think about some of the new claimants, the new participants who are coming to uh, universities and who might be upending the order as a result of very intentional efforts uh, by a more expansive and, um, and creative admissions policy that a number of universities like ours are running, you start to see, well, it's, it's getting complicated because there are these families that um, um, have been in the country for centuries and who were ostensibly part of majoritarian culture, but who could never see themselves here. So now we start to see, you know, as we get to think about how we bridge the different communities in our, in a, in a, in our um, university, they start to see maybe, you know, that, that people will start to transcend certain types of identities and start to see that maybe the socioeconomic the disadvantage that people have suffered across different racial groups, even including white Americans, maybe that becomes something that is uniting. And so it's open, it's open to those kinds of conversations and to that kind of connect, connection. There's, a, you know, there's an assumption underlying the, the, in this entire book, and I think underlying most sort of you know, political science definitions of what democracy should be. Uh, that that we that we are moving towards a multi-ethnic, pluralistic, democratic society, and that our goal is to achieve that. And we haven't quite achieved it yet. You know, we've tried many times in American history to fully realize the uh, the things that we wrote in our constitution. Um, and you actually write, there's no blueprint for building and sustaining this type of society because we haven't actually gotten there yet. Uh, and that is, you know, in, in one sense, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of disappointing because we want to have been, been there already. In another sense, we it feels very far away. Um, and and if you were to imagine America or the United States in particular having kind of this reckoning with the fact that we're not all the way there, that we're not a fully egalitarian, multi-ethnic democracy, if you were to imagine our country kind of coming to grips with that and, and truly facing it. Uh, we might also imagine that there would be a huge backlash, right, from traditional forces of white supremacy, patriarchy, you know, all of the, all of the traditional uh, systems that have kind of held us back from having that kind of truly egalitarian um, democracy. And so I wonder how you think about the role of universities in the face of that backlash, so that it's, it's you know, yes, we can bring in students who were, you know, generally not uh, privy to this type of sort of high education, um, but if we're going to see a backlash, regardless uh, of, this, of this sort of process of, of progress, uh, how, do you, how do universities handle that? And how do they address that backlash, you know, sort of head on or, or, or not head on? So again, I know, um, and I'd be interested in your, uh, your views on this as well, because I know you think a lot about this on a grander scale, um, and, and not, not just in the context of the university. Uh, but you know, it, it's, it seems to me that um, you know, one level, um, you know, we have to be prepared for the possibility that we will see this, this backlash. And in some sense, we, we see this in, at various moments where, where the idea of the university and its role is under contestation, and particularly um, in parts of the country 
that just don't see themselves in our activities. And so, again, when I, you know, as I discuss in the book, um, you know, the university has these roles that I think connect quite intimately to the democratic experiment. Um, we're talking a lot about social mobility. You know, it just seems in that domain, again, if I could just sort of turn to something I said a moment ago, you know, the way in which it's only been, you know, the last couple of years that even socioeconomic status, you know, is being talked about um, in a very explicit way, and that even that U.S. News and World Report is now building into its algorithm uh, for evaluating uh, the uh, performance of, uh, of universities, however you feel about that ranking system. But the fact that they're now focused on how many students uh, from low-income families are coming into the institution and are they completing university at the same pace of students from more advantaged families says something about ways in which we can speak to a part of the population that may not have heard us before and really have understood the character or commitment to equal opportunity. So I, I think something like that is helpful. I think the other themes that I touch in the book where I talk about even the restoration of, of talking explicitly about the character of the, um, the democratic opportunity and, and trying to equip our students with, with a belief in the core ideas of this country, albeit unrealized fully, uh, it's not fully realized, but nevertheless be seen to be protecting that idea that hopefully still has some resonance and, and is unifying. And again, I know these are things that you've thought about. Um, you know, it seems to me in those ways, along with how we deal with um, thinking about sharing the bounty of ideas about facts and knowledge in a way that, again, touches people with the problems, with the dilemmas that they're confronting. And again, I think this is something that we have powerful purchase with. So, you know, a, a point of pride, of course, for Johns Hopkins is this amazing site that Lauren Gardner and others uh, created to be able to track COVID, which we know became the authoritative source for how people understand the magnitude of the pandemic and, and, and the death and infection that resulted from that. Um, that's something that people across the political spectrum, in some sense, went to because they just wanted to have facts and have reliable facts. Again, I think that's a way in which we build capital that, you know, that hopefully engenders a deeper level of trust in the nature of our enterprise. And again, maybe cuts against some of the risk of the backlash that you talk about. But, but you know, fundamentally, we have to understand that we are regarded as places of privilege and that the and that the respect and confidence of the country has to be earned and re-earned. And, um, and, and you know, even in the face of populism and of anti-intellectualism, which of course is deeply inimical to our mission, there's still moments in which you've got to think about how can we somehow cut through that din and be able to get people who even reflexively are now suspicious of us who can see, well, hey, you know, my kid, uh, here in the middle of the country in a, in, a, in a red state, in a rural community, got that, you know, was invited to apply to a place like Hopkins, got admitted, is going there, or I've relied on their data, uh, or I understand, you know, these are institutions that are, are fighting to, to build, a, you know, um, um, an idea of the best of what this country can be. I think that, that becomes stirring and, and, and perhaps, you know, won't, won't on its own solve all the problems of our democratic uh, challenges right now, but it may contribute in a, in, in a, in a non-trivial way. Can you talk a little bit more actually about the informational role that you see universities playing? Because we're living in this time, right, where truth itself is embattled and right. it seems like Americans are living in entirely different realities and that are completely disconnected from one another, partly because of their media diets um, and partly because they are geographically segregated from each other, Democrats and Republicans. Um, and so, so how, how do universities, on, just on, as a whole, how do they try to get through 
that informational divide because that seems to me to be a really central central crisis that we're going through right now and and you know beyond sort of being able to say like yes we have we've got this great covid uh, informational right. yeah that that everyone does trust i think uh, well most people yeah. trust uh, but but the but the just the truth of reality and what you know what information is true and what information is false that's a that's a really basic challenge i think that's that's really threatening our democracy right now so how can universities really come combat that so i think it starts first and foremost with you know an understanding of why why at our best we are a critical guardian of knowledge and why although we may uh, conceive that there are absolute truths you know, we as academics know there, we have some humility. We know we get hopefully closer uh, to that to get a, you know, to get a truer sense of something. But we know that even things that we're quite confident of today, a year from now, we might find that there's reason to disavow that stance. And so, you know, we, we approach these issues, I think, with some humility. But we have a set of tools that are really important. We have, we have disciplinary values and norms that, you know, that department by department that, that differentiate what is a good claim from what is a bad claim. We have a strong sense of commitment to reason and to, and to the ways in which we find or present good arguments um, and arguments that will withstand scrutiny. And then, of course, we have this deeply, deeply um, intense commitment to the idea of skepticism and contestation and challenge that, again, makes us a special place for truth claims and, 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 and allows us to uh, be effective at, at, at demonstrating uh, what is true and what is less true or is, is false. And so I say all that because I think it, it requires that um, we go into the world with an understanding of how important a role we play as guardians of that knowledge and how even at times that the debate can be painful, unsettling, deeply alienating to some members of the community as, as, as received wisdoms are being challenged. Um, but nevertheless, because of how important we are to the, to, uh, the democratic experiment, we, we, have to, we have to be resolute in our willingness to uh, abide that kind of open debate and contestation. And from there, if we're doing that well, I think then it really requires us to worry a lot about something I talk about at length in the book, which is the issues of the, around reproducibility of our research. And one of the things that I don't think we spend nearly enough time worrying about is uh, how uh, in some disciplines there's a growing sense that uh, the research that is being uh, published is uh, not reproducible, that experiments that make claims later on can't be replicated. In some disciplines, the claim is uh, that this might be as high as 50% of articles that are being published. And so I th it's, again, consistent with this commitment to a certain approach to how we think about these truth claims and the need to make sure that we're bringing um, all of our capabilities to bear on ensuring that whatever claims that we are sharing with the world go through really rig rigorous examination and that ultimately can withstand outside scrutiny and, and are reproducible. Um, and so and if we've got that, then f it seems to me that from there, it really requires us to be able to share our ideas and work in a way that's accessible, like in the case of the COVID tracker, that complex data, complex ideas, we deliberately try and disseminate this in a way that the public can digest. Now, having said all that, this is what we should, this is the way in which we approach these issues. This is how we should share these ideas, and this is how we should share uh, the, the, this data. Um, I think whether you can cut through um, uh, this really uh, polarized and at times reckless and irresponsible 
uh, media environment um, is, is, is not always clear, and that's something we gotta worry about. But it seems to me there's still, there's enough outlets where we can still see places where we would be proud to have our ideas presented and that you know, there are media outlets where you know with confidence that at least for those people who are searching for something that is close to true as possible that they can gravitate to those sites. But on, you know, on the fringes, one worries and I'm not sure other than continue to do what we do best and do it as responsibly as possible and immunizing ourselves as much as possible from the claim that the work is not good or not replicable, I'm not sure how we can fix um, those sites and those distribution networks. Right, and, and, the, and I think that that is connected to this, this you know, what you describe as this lack of trust in, in you know, the general public of universities. Um, and, you kind of, and, and in the book you talk about how you know, the government really retreated from supporting higher education in the 1980s. And that you know, created this vicious cycle where then universities couldn't do as much anymore. And so the students became more cynical and less trusting of the universities. And so they got less money from the governments. And so then you know, this cycle continued. Uh, and I think we've actually seen a similar cycle, even in just public public investment, you know, public goods, government investing in communities and infrastructure, and all of these things that we've seen kind of crumbling. Um, and so there's one theory that the you know one way to increase trust in government is to is you know to reinvest in communities and to be for government to prove that they it can be there for people and help them. Um, is do you think that it's the same for for universities that that one of the ways to increase trust in universities is for is to reinvest in them and to allow them to become kind of you know go back in time to a time when they had resources and were able to help like, sort of more more generously so the issue really bites and it's a it's a really in, uh, important question but the issue really bites i think with uh, public universities in this country uh, state universities uh, that um, were very badly battered uh, during the Great Recession. And uh, what we saw during that time was that state governments under intense fiscal pressure decided to pull back from their support of their public institutions. And as a consequence, uh, those institutions ended up uh, having very significant tuition increases and not being able to invest in the kind of financial aid that would tr mitigate the impact of uh, those increases on, on, on students from disadvantaged families. And this was devastating, you know, in terms of, of, in terms of the um, accessibility of those institutions. And you know, as proud as I am of what we do at Hopkins and our undergraduate experience, you know, it is still small compared to the large, we have 5,000 undergraduate students as against the large state institutions that have tens of thousands of students and are in very important places where the promise of social mobility is being realized on a great scale. So when those institutions uh, were battered and forced to increase uh, their tuition levels and to function on much less in the way of state resources, I think this couldn't help but um, denude public trust in those institutions. So, you know, should should states one hopes, you know, if they were to restore that kind the kind of funding that state institutions enjoyed pre Great Recession and in, in, in at the level in real terms of what was what was then being offered, I think that I think that would be an important way in again um, demonstrating that this experience that students can get in higher education, which we know changes everything. You know, you've talked about social status, economic status, it brings a host of different benefits, but to the extent that it is done at a quality and with, um, and with regard to, to access issues that really um, model the Jeffersonian idea of equal opportunity, how can that not, not um, improve people's confidence in, um, in, in state government as well as you know, these institutions. I will say, and, I, and as a political science professor, I can't let the, as, as you are, I can't let the moment pass without saying, you know, it is remarkable though, you know, despite the fact we see a, you know, a different trend in the last election in terms of 
younger Americans being willing to vote. But you know, here, you know, one in some sense knows that um, politicians are rational. I like to think that most of the times they're rational actors and they, you know, they, they respond to the people who are electing them. And to the extent that for decades, we've seen a significant disparity between the voting patterns of older versus younger Americans with younger Americans um, not participating nearly to the degree historically that older Americans have. In some sense, it wouldn't be surprising that state governments, when confronted with trade-offs between investing in health and investing in education, um, we know how that, you know, that decision goes. So I think in part, you know, it's, this is why it's so important for young Americans to be voting um, in you know, greater numbers and particularly around these issues of investment in education and climate change, but, but I digress. <laughs> so there's, there's uh, a, a difference between how young people and older people vote. There's also a difference between how um, people in urban areas and rural areas vote. Uh, and that is increasingly striking, that difference. So we've, you know, the, our rural areas are, um, you know, increasingly Republican, whereas our urban areas are increasingly Democratic. And, and that creates this, this not just geographical polarization, but sort of an imbalance of political power towards rural areas where those votes sort of count more in our, just because of American institutions and the electoral systems. Um, but it also creates a question for, uh, for universities who, you know, you know, would want to attract you know, rural Americans into, into generally sort of more cosmopolitan environments or certainly more diverse environments than rural, than rural Americans tend to live in usually. Um, so if, if these Americans tend to be, you know, averse at universities in general, and, and some are aver averse to making this progress towards a more representative democ you know, multi-ethnic democracy, you know, you, you've said that one way that we can attract these, these students is to, is to really reach out to them and find them where they are um, and offer them opportunities to, to join these universities. What if they don't want to come? What if these, you know, what if these, these students don't want to go to a university, don't want to leave their rural area? They, you know, part, a lot of people don't leave rural areas because they like to stay there. You know, they want to stay right. close to family. They want to stay where, you know, where their generations of family lived right. before. Going to college is often leaving home. How do we attract these students who might otherwise not think of this as an option? You know, there's, there's been a lot of interesting work that's been done over the years on the so-called undermatch issue, which uh, people like Carolyn Hawksby and others have written about, which basically goes to your point, that is that there are a lot of students who end up at institutions that are, um, are um, less likely to be as challenging for them as good for them as they as they um, they could they could go to if 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 for any number of reasons they were to take advantage of the best institution that's available to them if you if you take this view that there's a you know a rank order of you know general groups of institutions that students could go to and some are you know offer a stronger experience than others and you know the the reasons that you describe you know that you've just gone through is you know why do people not leave uh, leave uh, small uh, small towns um, and and parts of the country? Um, maybe it's a, t a taste uh, for just that life, and they're very comfortable there. But you know the the literature shows that you know a lot of times it is you know this financial in the sense that you have you know. Uh, you may have uh, uh, family members who are dependent upon you. It may be that you just can't afford to leave town to go to an institution that is across the country or across state lines, whatever. And so, again, you know, not 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 being um, naive enough to believe that every student who could come to an institution like Johns Hopkins would necessarily come if you gave them an offer with with the level of, of financial aid additional support and so forth that would make it easy for them to come. But I do believe that lots would. And, and I think the proposition, and this is what we have to, I think, be unabashed about. I think the proposition, particularly in light of what you've written about and what you talked about a moment ago, in a country that is increasingly defined 
by these deep cleavage, cleavages, and particularly these, this urban-rural divide, which has now become a political divide, that what universities represent is uh, a chance to actually be cheek by jowl with a broad array of citizens from this country who come from, from so many different backgrounds and a moment where the sort of the patterns of living, um, working in enclaves where you're constantly surrounded by people who are just like you, that all gets upended when you come to a university. And again, particularly in a world where we don't have national service, we don't have national military service, where we're not forcing uh, this kind of mixing in American society. Universities you know, represent that opportunity. And, and I think trying to figure out how we, are, um, we get better at, at, at building the case for, assuming we got the financial support right, um, if that's what's needed, but the building the case for why a student would feel, even if I want to go back to my rural community, um, why they'd want to be part of this experience for four years, I think is really important. And I think it's, I think it's really important for them. It's important for us and it's important, it's important for the country. And you know, again, just even you know, to, uh, to go to one of the concrete suggestions that I play around with in the book, it's, um, it's to do something that we've just decided recently to do at Johns Hopkins to follow the lead of other institutions, which have now said, um, and we have now said, that um, students can't select their roommates um, coming into first year, that we're actually going to say, this is a moment where we're very deliberately going to mix it all up, that we're not going to let students replicate, do the, do the, do the thing that would be most logical for them, most natural in light of where they're coming from is to find someone who's just like me, who will, who will share this experience with me. But rather, what we want to do is take this opportunity to be intentional about mixing it up. And so, you know, uh, with 70% of Americans now graduating from high school and going on to some kind of post-secondary education, if more and more universities uh, were more focused on this kind of bridging exercise of how you get these different, uh, different students hailing from different backgrounds to interact with one another. I, I feel quite hopeful that this could play an important role on getting us out of the morass that we're in right now, which is just so mean um, and, um, and so, so corrosive. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start asking uh, some other questions from, uh, from the audience. But before I do that, I really just want to underscore what you just said, which is and I think it's so important that the, you know, there are two things that we know that reduce intolerance and conflict. And one of them is contact with people who are unlike us. And the other one is common identities. And I think one of the great things about universities is that through this you know, period of time when you're all there together, it, you create a new identity, right? And so it becomes a super, it becomes a superordinate identity that everyone can can hold on to at the same time, regardless of where they came from or who they were before. I, I agree with that. And you know, what's really interesting is is what's what's so exciting, so so inspiring about the university experience um, is at one level, students are coming here and saying, you know, I didn't really think of myself as this before and thinking about some particularistic identity that they now have the freedom to, you know, to, to interrogate and to embrace. And so there's, there's these moments where students are coming here who you know, just haven't seen enough students who are like them. And so they get to pursue that with a kind of a support and encouragement that they never had before. But at the same time that they're doing that, and they might find, in fact, they're associated with a number of particularistic identities. But at the same time they're doing that, they're part of this broader experience of becoming a Hopkins undergrad and a Hopkins, ultimately, a graduated Hopkins student, and what it means to uh, be part of something that's, that's, that complements and enriches those particularistic identities and yet is another form of compelling identity. I know, again, you, you think a lot about this uh, on you know, a broader stage of America generally, but again, I think institutions 
are the place where this kind of, this has to happen in, institu in an institutional setting. And we're an important institution. I think this is a good place for this, these kinds of things to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's extremely important. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some time uh, to some questions that are uh, coming from people who either registered or are asking questions now. Uh, I'm actually going to ask, uh, the first question I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up is, I'm, this is self-interested because I am on the faculty of the SNF Agora Institute, which is a democracy, institu pro-democracy institute. Um, we have can a question. Can we call it a liberal democracy? A liberal answer? democracy. <laughs> By the way, did I did I get the liberal democracy definition about? Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. Most people don't think of those terms that way. That's yeah, why no, it, it's important to establish yeah. that. Um, so there is someone's writing in as the director of a democracy institute, and says they would be interested in hearing about your views on the state of democracy centers and institutes in academia more broadly. Uh, and the importance of a multidisciplinary model of research for addressing issues around democracy. Uh, that's that's a great question and a great question um, that I can't speak to the state of all democracy institutes. I know that there are several that have followed the lead of uh, what we've been able to do at Hopkins with the uh, SNF uh, Agora Institute, um, and um, and. And I think that precisely as the questioner uh, uh, said, having a um, dedicated program place on campus that brings together a number of different disciplines to think through uh, the challenges of democracy and how you think about uh, uh, responding to this moment where we worry um, that this experiment is in peril. Um, I think is really important. And what's exciting about what we're doing at SNF Gora, and particularly you know, exciting when I see uh, colleagues like you who are now here at Hopkins, I think is, is important in the number of different um, intellectual perspectives, political perspectives that are all being brought to bear on this moment. And so I think that's having that a place on campus where there's programming, research, deep engagement around these issues that hopefully will uh, radiate out throughout the campus and draw a number of colleagues who have interest in these issues into the conversation is really important. And again, it's a way in which I think we as universities earn our stripes in this moment. There's another question. I know that we've had this conversation a little bit before. Um, on would it be possible and desirable to create a required course on democracy for all undergraduate students at Johns Hopkins University or to build other core curricular requirements on civics? So um, I, think, I, th I think that's uh, a very interesting, um, indeed, um, I think an important challenge for us. And um, it's one that I, uh, I do write about in the, in the, in the book. Um, and, um, again, you know, it starts off with a sense that um, if we take the view that the democratic enterprise is hard and that it requires certain understandings, habits, commitments to be successful on the part of its citizens, then the next question is, can we just assume by virtue of having grown up in a democracy uh, that that is sufficient training for that role. And again, the idea of democracy, of course, places the citizen at the core of it, and so that you're not a passive bystander, you are, you are a participant in that enterprise. And um, here we know, and this is, I think, uh, uh, really lamentable, but we know that um, only about 25% of high school students graduating in the United States have received what one would say is a good grounding in civics, in an understanding of the nature of the ideas, the institutions that fuel uh, democracy. And so we know a lot of our students are coming here to Johns Hopkins as other institutions and are not uh, tutored in that. And if you, if you feel as I do that these are important skills, knowledge, um, uh, values to be able to impart, that we've got to give uh, to pick up on something that Danielle Allen, a scholar at Harvard, said: if we got to we got to share the owner's manual for this uh, for this uh, unique and important uh, 
project that we're all involved in, then I think it does fall to us to, 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 to confront the question of are we, are we doing an adequate job of educating for this? Uh, you know, in some ways, we've this over the last several years in the context of our student orientation, we've had moments like uh, the, uh, the, the uh, program that occurs early in our orientation week when we talk about the importance of academic freedom as a central animating idea of the university. Um, and we this year, through the help of the Agora Institute, had a fabulous program that we called Democracy Day where we introduced students to some of the current challenges uh, that uh, democracy is facing. But I don't think that's sufficient. And I think uh, particularly in the context of the discussion at least we're having at this institution about how we think about educating students in um, the challenges of citizenship in an increasingly uh, complex world. Um, I think in that setting, coupling um, uh, an understanding of core democratic institutions and the nature of democratic uh, ideas along with, uh, with a, I think, a, um, a, a critical evaluation of how well that, um, that, that project has been realized, I think is something we should be doing. And, uh, you know, if, if, if I had my druthers, I'd really hope that every student would leave having exposure to that. And again, um, I know um, the idea of mandatory courses or selections from a group of identified courses is not typically how we think about things at Johns Hopkins. But again, if we go back to this idea, we're in a perilous moment um, and that we have the power with the, with the population we have to do something that might be able to help ameliorate some of the some of the uh, some of the uh, worst excesses of this moment, it seems to me we ought to be doing it. So related to that, uh, this question asks: Given recent attempts to block the teaching of critical perspectives in public education, uh, what should universities' role be in proactively, not passively, promoting truth and progress? So it's what we it's 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 what we what we it's what we have to do. So you know the, um, it's again you know this goes to the core enterprise of the academy and the and the commitment we have to academic freedom and to supporting difficult um, unsettling um, conversations that lead us to a truer state of the understanding of the world of which we're part. And I, you know, to my mind, although it is a broad rubric to talk about critical race theory, you know, there are several important ideas embedded in that enterprise that colleagues here at Hopkins and elsewhere are exploring. And, um, and, and that's an important part of what we do um, and, and, and must be supported. Yeah, I would ask. The way that I think about it is, if, if you know, if if truth becomes partisan and our and our mission is to be nonpartisan, then we can't really be committed to truth, and that that's one of the main challenges I think that's facing political scientists and also media figures, and and shouldn't be holding universities back, perhaps. Um, so someone does ask, how do we carry out productive conversations with those with entrenched political views on the extremes of the political spectrum? And what can universities do to teach these skills to students and possibly to ameliorate polarization in the long term? So getting through those tough boundaries. Right. So, um, you know, that's something that, um, you know, we, we spend an awful lot of time talking about these moments um, on university campuses which, you know, in which, you know, provocative speech is comes to campus and then there's you know debates as to whether or not the speech should be accommodated or not and um, and you know should there you know should should the speaker be disinvited or supported and 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 you know this is this is this is you know again these moments don't occur with great frequency but when they do occur they command lots of attention and they call into question you know how we deal with uh, this. Uh, core commitment that I discussed before to ac academic freedom and open debate, but I think you know um, what is what is really important is to see if we can avoid the moments when it's about the single speaker and try and think about ways in which we construct um, events, activities where 
students are seeing and participating in debates in which what we're actually doing is bringing together people who have views that are um, in conflict one, one another. But as, as, as the students see those moments when there is debate around difficult subjects, and they can see the extent to which there's probing, there's testing of the ideas, that you know, maybe it turns out that the, you know, the, the differences between folks who are involved in these debates are truly, they're truly uh, um, uh, driven by fundamentally different values that animate their positions. But maybe it turns out that they actually have more, um, more comedy on those underlying values and what's really at play is a different understanding of of, of the facts that are involved in a particular uh, debate or policy area. And so here, again, I think that having moments in which we can model the power of civic friendship, and it doesn't mean you ultimately you know, agree with the person with whom you're debating or involved in a, you know, in a, in a, in a conversation that may span years, if not decades, but what's important is you come back to the table and you continue to try and work through these issues um, in a way that I think if, if we did more of that, we'd be less called upon to be umpire between these you know, claims as to whether you know, an event should or shouldn't happen. And we become educators in showing the power of this kind of exchange and interaction. So how do we balance that with protecting the dignity and humanity of all of our students, right? Because if, if, some, if some of these speakers are potentially harming you know, our students' feelings of dignity or safety, how do we make sure that everyone feels that they're, that they're safe and okay in, in a place and on, on a campus while also having that conversation? So I think it starts with, again, you know, the way we talked before about liberal democracy, these, these ideas are are both important and legitimate and they, and they often align but not always. And, 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 and so here too, I think that ta our task is to construct as broad an ambit for free speech and for open debate as we can, but at the same time making it clear that, um, that the people who are in our community are at the table, have a right to be at the table, have a right to be heard. And that um, as difficult as unsettling these conversations can be, it ultimately doesn't deny any one participant's right to be here. And you know, that's what we've got to communicate. You, know, you are all here uh, because um, we saw in you um, a level of achievement and aspiration that you know, makes you really valued members of our community. And so that can't be put in doubt. But having said that, you know, questions, subjects, uh, debates that might be painful or unsettling, I think still have to happen. Um, and, um, but, but hopefully, if we do our job right, we can signal the, um, to uh, those who may be uh, unsettled in those moments that that doesn't mean that uh, they don't have a right to be here or to be uh, participants in the debate. So that's, that's a task that we have as educators, I think, in, in contemporary universities. Yeah, great. I think that's universal theme of just sort of like, there are a lot of tensions here, and yeah. this is what we're working with. Right. This is what we're trying to do. Um, OK, so I think that I want to wrap our conversation up here. Thank you so much for having that conversation with me. I think we all learned a lot. and. Um, we're going to hand it over to Stephen to, uh, to give us our concluding remarks. Thank you, President Daniels and Dr. Mason, for such a great, thought-provoking conversation. And thank you to our audience for joining us tonight and adding your own questions to this important discussion. If you haven't been able to read what universities owe democracy, you can do so for free on Project Muse. You can find that link on the live stream page below the video player. You can also find information about all of SNF Agora's upcoming events or sign up for our bi-monthly e-newsletter by clicking on the links below. Finally, a recording of this evening's conversation will be available on our website, snfagora.ghu.edu, and on our Institute YouTube channel. Thank you again, and enjoy your evening. <laughs>